Good morning. It is so good to be here with, with all of you this morning. As was said of, of this good crowd that we have here, we have some who are visiting. We are so thankful for your attendance here. We hope that uh, the things that you hear and, and see today uh, will be things that are glorifying to God. That is our, our greatest desire. That is our hope in our time together that we build one another up in ways that honor and glorify our God our Creator, as we've just read about. And I'm so thankful for, for Bishop, who did such a fantastic job reading those verses for us. If you want to kind of leave your Bibles open, open here in just a moment, we're going to come back to this idea of, of the creation account and of what God did in the beginning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we are getting ready to start studying. In the course of this year, we're going to be looking at this idea of exchange. And that is the, the title of our of our yearly series, and it is focusing on the issue of idolatry. So as we get into this, as we start this, we need to lay some groundwork as to how we're going to understand the concept of idolatry, understand the terminology that we'll be using, and I hope today we can, we can kind of uh, present some of that in a way that, that helps us to do so. To begin, I want to say this, you and I are merely reflections when uh, the boys were little, uh, we were worshiping at the, the Lake Street Church of Christ, and it was time to go. The services were over. We were gathering everything up to get out to the car, and we're looking for the boys. And inevitably, the, the kids at the congregation there would, would gather in the nursery of that, of that church building, and, and that's generally where we'd find them at. And so I went, and I opened the door to the nursery, and Ryder's standing there with his songbook, and all the other kids have their songbooks open, and they were having this little worship service of their own after services were over. They were reflecting what they had seen. They were reflecting the things that they had watched us, uh, us to do. And I'm sure uh, many of you who have, who have children, many of you parents have witnessed much of the same thing in your own children, mimicking and reflecting the way that you talk, the way that you act. We are reflections. In high school, I remember the peer group that I was maybe most closely associated with. Uh, we were very anti-conformist. We were going to look like everybody else. So we'd, we were the kids that would, would go around and just wanted to, to, to stand out in some way that, that said, I'm, I'm not going to fall in line with, the, uh, the, with this group or with that group. And, because we were too cool for that, I guess. Uh, Oddly enough, we all looked exactly like one another. We all conformed to uh, this idea that we'd come up together. But you, you can remember this idea maybe from your time in school as we had these, these cliques. And cliques generally reflect the, the nature of, of the group. And so you had those that were very athletic. And the, the, the members of that group would, would reflect that athleticism. They would all be involved in sports in some way or all be involved in something to demonstrate their athletic abilities. Maybe you had the group that was, was very focused on their schoolwork, and they would reflect that as well, even down to the clothes that we wore. There would be those groups that reflected our, our desire to have the very best of fashion, the very uh, cutting edge of, of what, is, what is popular and so they all dressed in a very similar way, uh, even down to those that, that were in search of, of ways to escape the, the pressure of school or to find fun in things such as drugs and alcohol. The people in that group reflected that. The group reflects what it, what it, what it glorifies. It reflects what it holds as valuable or important. And if you're going to join that, you are going to have to, to be accepted, you are going to have to reflect that as well. This is a pattern I hope we see. It's a pattern that is kind of imprinted onto us in humanity, but it's a pattern that is a very old one, one that has its roots right in the book of Genesis in the creation account. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, we read that man is made in God's image. Then God said, let us make man in our image, According to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. 
God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over everything that moves on the earth. Mankind was created to reflect the image, or we might say the glory, even the glory of God. So God made you and He made me to be that reflection. The question today and what we will be kind of going through this year and and trying to determine is, is that what I reflect? Do I reflect what I've been made to reflect, the glory of God? If not, inevitably, I will reflect something else in God's creation. In the beginning, God made man in his image, but God also made everything else. And so if man was going to reflect the image of God as he was designed, that was good. But if he wasn't, what was left? Except something that God had made. Something that was inferior to God, but nonetheless made by God. We will inevitably reflect something in creation. And Paul uses, while slightly different terms, uh, much of the same ideas... When he makes the point in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, he speaks of those who have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. He's making the very same point. And so in the course of this study, in the course of this series this year, there's really just a couple of things that I hope we'll, we'll grow to learn. And I hope they'll be cemented into our thinking as we go forward in life. One is, I hope we'll learn that what we reflect is directly tied to what we worship and to our service. That which we say is worthy. That which we say, I will will give allegiance to and serve this thing. We are going to reflect that. This will change not only the way that I hope we approach the, the corporate worship as we are together worshiping as the people of God, but I also hope it will change the way we spend our time and our lives every day. Number two, I hope that we will learn that the things which we revere are the things that we will resemble. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next month. We'll speak a little bit more by in- introducing this topic that what you worship, you become. And, and we, we, may, we, we may delve into that a little bit more next month to say, not just do we, we become what we worship, well, we become like. We take on the characteristics, we keep, take on the nature of that which we worship. And that will either lead to our restoration or that will lead to our ruin. And then number three, I hope that we will learn that the greatest threat that mankind has ever faced In reflecting the glory of God is the worship of idols. We may think that's not a problem for us today, but I hope this morning we'll begin to discover otherwise. And to do so, we have to ask this question, what is idolatry? And the first point that we're going to bring up may come as a bit of a shock to you. Idolatry is the most mentioned sin in all of the Bible. You might think now, now surely lust or or homosexuality, or adultery, and fornication, murder, and greed. Certainly, these things, these are are more prevalent sins that, that people deal with. Certainly, that's more discussed than any other sin. But throughout the, the, throughout the book, throughout the, the library of, of God's Word, the theme of, the, of idolatry is approached, discussed, referenced more so than any other sin. It is alluded to, it is combated in nearly every book of the Bible. It affected the families of the patriarchs of the, uh, of the New Testament. It affected the, the, the members of the Greek and Roman culture. I think as we look back and, and, and trace the, the people that have been touched or, or have, have had their lives uh, controlled or, or tempted by the problem of idolatry, it would be very foolish for us to say that every, gen- every dispensation or every generation has had to deal with this except for ours. We just don't struggle with that like they did. 
certainly we wouldn't be that foolish to think that it has no significance to us today. The problem, I think, becomes in understanding their definition of idolatry. We might say, I'm not an idolater because I don't have any carved images. I'm not an idolater because I, I don't have a, a rock set up in my house. There's no stone statues or golden or silver figures. I'm not an idolater because I believe in the one true God. So I can't possibly be an idol worshiper. I don't believe in any of these other gods that are associated with them. So let's just pick about that for a moment. Can we be an idol worshiper and believe in the one true God at the same time? Well, throughout the Bible, the answer to that is, is emphatically yes. Yes, it is a very big problem for God's people. At the most simplified definition, idolatry is just, it, is, it simply is the worship of idols. But understanding that idols are anything that take the place the rightful place of God at the center of our lives. And, and maybe thinking about that, the center of our lives and the, the, the core of our heart, of our thinking, of our actions, begins to reveal the danger of idolatry, that this is not simply about going in, into a temple or, or having a shrine or, or having a, a figure. This is a heart problem. It's something that is hard to see externally because it affects us within. There are many people who don't walk around with their idols and they don't have shrines built to them in their home, although through the course of this year, I think we might discover that that might be the case, maybe even our own houses and we not realize it. But instead, the shrines are built within our hearts. I want you to turn over to Ezekiel chapter 14. We, we studied this passage not too long ago in our Ezekiel study, but we're going to go back and revisit it. In Ezekiel 14, we read about these elders who seem to have this desire to speak to God, or at least have God speak to them. So they come and they sit with his prophet. They sit with Ezekiel. In verse 2, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. And have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? God says, I don't want to be consulted by these men. I don't want to, to have this relationship with them because of idolatry. Idolatry has infected their hearts. So even in the Old Testament, where we generally see the picture of idolatry in the the statues and the, and the the figures that have been made up to the the Baals and the, the Asheroth and and the various ways that even in our their own homes they would have household idols household gods even in the old testament god says the problem is is in the heart the problem is these men have set up an idol an idol they've set up idolatry in their heart Paul is going to continue that thought in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, when he makes a very similar statement. Colossians 3, verse 5, he's talking about the putting away of, of old things and, and the new man that is coming out of, of this, this rebirth and, and how our focus was, is with God. Our focus is on things above. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, he starts talking about some of these things that we are to consider dead. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, just think about those things for a minute. The, the idea of impurity, the impure thoughts, impure actions, our passions, our evil desires, it's... it's, it's it's easy to see sometimes the physical manifestation of an evil desire, but our desires are something that occur within us. Greed, we can see when people act in greedy ways, but greed infects our heart, it infects our thinking, it infects the things that we dwell upon. And Paul says these things, these hidden things of the heart, are, idol, are idols, are idolatry. Both of these groups that he is addressing, whether it be the, the Christians that he's writing to in Colossae or the, the men of Israel who 
the, the elders of Israel, who, who God says, I, I, will not be con, uh, I will not have a, a relationship with them. I will not be uh, consulted by them. They are believers in the one true God. They are people who have said God is, is set apart from everything else. And yet in their heart, they're described as idol worshipers. Idolatry goes far beyond worship, worshiping statues. It is a sin that first takes place and is rooted and grows and dwells within the heart of mankind. So where did this sin originate? If this is the most alluded to, most mentioned sin in the Bible, and it is such a danger to mankind, and it, it forms in our hearts, and it festers and dwells there, where did it first come from? Where, where did this uh, uh, originally occur? One of the first references to the idea of someone that is worshiping something other than God might come from Genesis 31, verse 30. When Jacob and Rachel have, have escaped from, from Laban, they have snuck off, and Laban tracks them down, mainly it seems to gather back his idols. He says, you've stolen my, my household gods. The, the word that is used there is sometimes image, but they had stolen his gods. Verse 19, it was, we learn Rachel, the one that had done this, stolen her father's images. This is the first time we see words being used to specifically indicate that that there was some form or some structure, some physical manifestation of idolatry and, and the worship of an idol. But it, we can go back further than that. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, you have the account that we're uh, likely very familiar with, the account of, of Babel, the, the Tower of Babel. And what happens here? We see mankind creating this edifice. They, they create this monument, if you will, to reflect the glory of their name. We want, to, you know, God has given us instruction to go and be fruitful and fill the earth. We are made in his image. We are supposed to be filling the earth with his image. But what we see in, in chapter 11 of Genesis, they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let us make some monument to man. Certainly, this was idolatrous in its worship of the name, the, the glory of mankind. But we must understand that that didn't begin in Genesis 11. That begins and is rooted in something far, far sooner than that in, in the re recorded Bible. I want to suggest today that while not specifically described as idolatry, Adam and Eve are the first ones to exhibit idolatrous worship in their decision to eat of the tree which God forbid. And so in this account, there's a point when Adam decides that he is going to turn from God, he is going to stop revering God, and the instruction that he has given him to reflect his glory, and in so doing, Adam begins to take on the semblance, he begins to resemble a new object, an object that I would argue that now has gained his reverence. A brief account of the creation story may assist us in, in seeing this picture. As we've already read, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, it revealed that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were created and tasked with, with filling the world with that image of his glory. And God tells them to do three things specifically. Three things you might, you might think, well, why did he attach that at the end of that section? Verse 28, why did he attach that? He said to be fruitful and multiply. He said to fill the earth, subdue it, ruling over it. These things reflect the very work that God has done up to this point. God ruled over his creation through his created word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Through his created word. Uh, nothing that came into creation came into creation without him. Everything that came into being came into the being the way that he, that he described it to come into being. It did exactly what he expected it to do in being created. He was ruling over creation. 
And you would argue even that He had subdued creation. He subdued the darkness and the chaos that, that existed there uh, in the very beginning. We see the, the world was, was dark and void. And yet God subdued that. And from that separated light... And from there on, that's, that's the picture we see through the rest of the Bible. God is separating light from darkness. Separating good and righteousness from evil and unholiness. And then God created life. And as you read through that, what does He say when He looks down at the end of each day? He, he sees His creation. He sees the, the, the mountains and the streams. He sees the the oceans, the, the moon and stars. He sees the, the, the plant life and the animals. And man, he looks at all of this and he says, it is good. So God rules over. God subdues. God creates His image. And then He goes to man and says, you specifically have been made in My image. Go continue what I have started. And that instruction to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and rule over it and subdue it is God saying, you have seen what I have done. Carry on my nature. Carry on my characteristics. Go into the world as, as if you are little gods that are carrying on me, that are doing what I have begun to do. Go and do that. Almost as if we are his children, the same way that we might think about our own children. But after doing so, God does something interesting. He takes these little images of God that he has made, and he sets them up in a place that, as Bishop read for us, is, is set apart. It's a place that is a, almost like a temple, the Garden of Eden. And in fact, from there on out, we're going to see anytime God is discussing a place that is wholly set apart for Him, it resembles characteristics of the garden. It resembles the, the, the characteristics in nature that we see described in the garden. He sets them up in this temple and He tasks them, reflect my glory. I think this may become part of the issue and the reasoning for why God's second commandment and the first and second commandment that He gives the Israelites in the Ten Commandments, the first and second commandment are the greatest, or the longest, I should say. They are the longest of all the commandments. He gives them the second commandment and He says, I forbid you to make created images which reflect My glory. Not just don't make images, don't serve, serve idols. Don't make an image that's supposed to represent me. Well, why not? Doesn't that seem like a good thing, God, for us to have? Maybe his answer would be because I've already did that. I made the image that's supposed to reflect me. It is you. And inevitably, because you have not seen me, anything that you create, again, Romans 1.25, is going to reflect the glory of creation not the Creator Himself. Now before we go on, I think it's interesting to consider <clears throat> that many of the Near Eastern religions of that day that worshipped idols adopted a very similar view of how an idol became a manifestation of their deity. When you go to the, the, and look at the, the Canaanite Religions or the, the people from the Mesopotamian area that worship Mesopotamian gods. Uh, we maybe sometimes get the notion that somehow they, they, they picked up this rock and they kind of chiseled away on it and, and they set it down and said, Whoa, look at that. That God, that God that has been there forever is the God that I'm going to serve. Or maybe to just steal directly from Aaron, uh, the calf just jumped out of the fire and, that, and that's your God. But in reality, we, we've discovered through, through uh, documents, that, through, through archaeology, through things that we have found, that the idea that they created idols and then just kind of accepted that they had always been is, is really not true. Instead, they would create the idol. They would go to the workshop where the, the idolater or the, the, the smith would, would mold and shape 
the, uh, the structure, and then they would take it somewhere, somewhere special where they would wash it and they would prepare it. They would sanctify it maybe. And in so doing, they would prepare it to be the manifestation of the God it was going to represent. They would then take it to a place that would serve as its temple. Maybe it would be a riverbank. Or it'd be a, a, a stand of, of woods. It might actually be a shrine or a temple itself. But in there, placing it in its position, it would then be ready to accept the deity that they already believed in to come and inhabit its body. You think, why do we need to know that? They were stealing from what happened in creation. They were taking what the creation account describes. Listen, listen closely to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 7 through 15. Well, actually just 7 and 15. Genesis 2 verse 7 and verse 15. And think about how closely that, that, that idea follows what God did. It says in verse 7, Then God formed man of the dust. In his workshop, he created man. And then he took him... <clears throat> And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So God takes man and he forms him in his workshop. He inserts into him his breath and man became a living being. And then in verse 15, he goes and he establishes him. He takes the man and puts him in the Garden of Eden. He goes and he sets up. You could almost say that God had created this small idol in Adam. And he breathed his manifestation into it and went and set him up in his temple and said, this is my image. This is the idol that is me. How does that illustrate, though, that Adam and his sin in the garden was a form of idolatry? We need to remember that idol worship is reverencing anything other than God. We need to remember that what we resemble, we will, or what we revere, we will go on to resemble. Adam's choice in the garden, after he has been set up by God to be his image, be my reflection into this world, resemble me. His choice in the garden indicates, one, at the very least, Adam had shifted his allegiance from God to himself. But I think there's a very good argument to say that Adam had begun to not revere God, but revere Satan, revere the serpent as well. Think about this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. We know that that is a lie based upon what uh, Bishop read for us in verse 17. We know it's a lie. The serpent was a liar. Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and also in verse 13, we see that the serpent is crafty. He is deceitful. He is cunning in his deceit. Why do we consider that? Because when God asked Adam... When he came to the garden and found them hiding from him, and he said, have you eaten from the forbidden tree? In chapter 3, verse 11, think about Adam's response. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. That's a yes or no question, by the way. You ever ask your child a question, did you do that? And then and the first answer is, well, and they're going to start telling you all the things that went in. It's a yes or no question. Did you, did you kick your brother? Did you, did you have this fight? Did you say this word? Well, no. What's the answer? God says, did you eat from the tree, Adam? It's a yes or no. But yet Adam immediately begins crafting, just as, as, as the serpent had crafted this instruction to Eve, he begins crafting this deceitful tale of how this is really the woman's fault, and in some ways, God, this is really your fault, because you're the one that gave me the woman. <clears throat> he deceptively shifts, shifts the blame off of himself and onto Eve and onto God. 
What led to this terrible decision, however, begins back in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 3. And if we will consider that for a moment, the serpent asks Eve this question. You know, we're looking at, at Adam and how he's, revering, he's resembling the, the serpent. But let's go back a little bit and consider Eve for a moment. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 3, the sermon says, if, if God has really forbidden you to eat from all the trees of the garden. Now let's consider what Eve says. What does she say there in, in chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 2? She says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. Satan says, did God say you can't eat from the trees of the garden? She says, from the fruit, or from the trees of the garden, we may eat. Well, is that really what God said? Is that really the, the, what God had instructed her? To see that, we go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse, uh, verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 16. God said, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. The last word might seem ins insignificant to us, but for just a moment, think about this, that Eve chose to leave this instruction out. Eve chose to, to keep this to herself or, or to have forgotten it as not important. But in effect, she minimized the blessing. God didn't just say, you can eat from any tree. God said, you can eat freely from any tree. From all the trees of the garden. You can eat as much as you want. The, the magnitude of the blessing that God has placed in their lives is being detailed in the word freely, without restraint. You can eat from any tree of the garden. And yet, when Satan comes to Eve and says, did God really say you could eat from any tree or that you could not eat? She says, well, we, could, we can eat from the other trees. Keep reading in verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Now, some of your translations may say, lest we die. Let's consider again, is that what God had said to Eve? Go back to verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, there's, there's some argument that has been made that Eve was was again minimizing God's, uh, uh, God's words here. She, she already seems to kind of have minimized the blessing that he gave them when he said, eat freely, and she said, we can, we can eat of the other trees. But when she says, lest we die, as opposed to, we will surely die, minimizing the, the consequence. But that's really not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on what Eve does that completely modifies, completely changes what God said. She adds a commandment. The restriction was to not eat from the tree. And she says we are to not eat or to even touch the fruit. Now the only reason I bring this up is again we see a reflection that is similar to the character of the serpent who likewise minimizes the consequence which God had placed upon them for eating the fruit, but He did it by adding just one word. Not. You will not surely die. We see these differences in the way that Adam and Eve, people who had been created to reflect the glory of God, and yet now are reflecting the characteristics of this serpent that has slithered in amongst them, or I guess we really should say she walked in amongst them, but this serpent that now is in their midst, they begin to look more and more like Satan and less and less like God as this account goes on up until the moment until they take the fruit and eat of it. And that leads to this statement that's made by God in Genesis 3.22, and He says, Behold, man has become like one of us. What does that mean? There's an interesting comment made by a writer, Christopher Wright, uh, who says, it was not that humans had now become gods, but they had chosen to act as though they were. 
defining and deciding for themselves what they will regard as good and evil. Therein lies the root of all other forms of idolatry. We deify, let's focus on this last line, we deify our own capacities. If there is not a better picture of idolatry then we deify our own capacities. Like the Canaanite priest who deified the sculpted rock that he had made, Adam deified his ability to judge between that which was good and that which was evil, choosing to turn from God and set himself up as an idol to humanity's own likeness. God has in the beginning created all these things. He created me to reflect his image. Everything that he created, he said was good. I know what's good because God has made it. And there's maybe even a thought that if I don't know what's good, I'm in, the, the, the cent- I'm in this temple place where, where God walks with me. And in the middle of that is God's planted tree of the knowledge of good and evil. While the scriptures never indicate this, the question maybe comes up, should we go there and ask God if this is good or evil? But instead, it is the place where man went and said, you know what, I think I can do that. And they took, they saw that it was wise, or that it was good to make them wise, and they said, let's take and let's eat. Adam had deified his own abilities. We see going forward from here, that man and God's relationship is tarnished. But we also see something begin to happen from this point forward. Our glory. And we're going to, this, this is going to be a term that we see throughout this series. The glory or their glory, our glory. Whenever God talks about Israel and their glory. On their own, they had no glory. But Israel had entered into a relationship with God that made them glorious. On his own, Adam has no glory. But Adam has been made in the image of God, and so he has been given glory. Our glory, mankind's glory, was exchanged. We took the glory that God had given us, and we exchanged it for a lie. A lie that Satan had told that said, hey, if you will do this, you won't die. And we, with the idea that we can somehow do better, we can be rightful judges between good and evil, took that glory upon ourselves. And where did it immediately lead? It immediately leads to a separation from God. It immediately leads to a broken image. Or you might even say a broken idol. Mankind suffers the death of that God has promised. Physically, we see death occur, start to occur, but also spiritually, we are separated from God as we are cast out from the garden. And God places up barriers to, to ensure that we are not able to enter back in. This problem doesn't end, however, with just Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 5, we read these words that stand out to me as I think about this this issue. It says, The book of generations of Adam, in the day when God created man, man, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. We get the, the, the retelling of the creation account. But then verse 3, Adam lived 130 years, He became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and he named him Seth. I think the the Bible records that line, not just to say Seth was a spitting image of his father. He he looked like Adam. I think it's a a, a bit of a sorrowful note that man who had been made in the image of God had broken that image, and his offspring looked just like him, broken, not sharing the glory that God had first given them, but taking on this deceitful glory that man had received. 
Spreading out from here came the continuation of humanity, which repeatedly chose to revere vain and worthless, worthless things, and it led to further ruin. We see that immediately following these accounts in Genesis 6 and the flood. It carries on again to the wilderness wandering of, of the children of Israel. It goes on to the cycle of the judges, the exile and captivity of, of Israel and Judah. And finally, eternal judgment. All of this, all of this spinning out from this problem that occurred in the beginning of time that is maybe best described as man's idolatry. I hope that what we see from all this is this is not a problem about stone figures and gold and silver statues. As we come to a close today, I want us to consider a few ways that we might today struggle with idolatry, but I want us to really spend time focusing on how we're going to overcome it through the power of Christ. As we go through this study, towards the end of the year, we will get more into these, these ideas. We'll get more into these ideas of, of how idolatry might affect us today. But I ask you to consider, for the, for the time being, how things such as money and possessions and pursuits, whether it be of a career or of education, how our hobbies or even how various vices in our life, such as alcohol or drugs, our own families... Nationality, politics, consider how these things can become idols. Remembering our definition, an idol is something that takes, takes the place where God deserves to be set up in the center of our lives. It takes that place and we grow to resemble what we revere. We grow to look like what we worship. I want you to consider how those things may be idols for us today. And then I want you to ask yourself this question. I am a reflection. What am I a reflection of today? Will I be a reflection of the Almighty God or a reflection of the Almighty Dollar? Am I a reflection of the glory of prestigious accomplishment? Am I a reflection of a self-made man that has pulled himself up and made himself into what he is today? As I said, we're going to consider more about how these things become idols in our lives and lead to idol worship and how they steal from us the very blessing that God seeks to provide by placing His glory into our lives. But I want to end by reminding you this. Idolatry is pervasive. Idolatry has filled the world. And idolatry is utterly defeated by Jesus Christ. He has overcome he has accomplished it. So how do you and I overcome idolatry today? Again, things that we will get into more, but very quickly, number one, let us be honest. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, we are told to test ourselves. Very similarly to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28. In partaking of the Lord's Supper, let everyone examine themselves. I'm asking you to honestly open yourself up and say, is there an idol in my life? Is there something that I revere and I raise up higher than God? Is there something else at the center of my life? Be honest about that. And then approach it with wisdom. Remember, Romans chapter 1, verse 25 revealed that part of the problem with idolatry was the exchanging of a truth for a lie. So seek to understand the deceitful limitations of your idols because they will not sustain you. They will ultimately fail. They will ultimately be destroyed at the coming of our Lord. They will certainly not save your souls. They will not provide an eternal life. So be wise as we approach these, these idols that may crop up in our lives. And lastly, be God-first people. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus told us we cannot serve two masters. We will either hate one and love the other. <clears throat> but what I want us to understand is that through prayer and through persistence, 
We must tear down our idols and put God back in his proper place as the master of our lives. In fact, shortly after saying that, Matthew 6, 24, he said, we cannot serve two masters. He said this in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. Money isn't evil. Neither is education or a career, having a hobby, being a part of a family, being engaged in politics. None of these things on themselves are evil. But they must always fall into their proper place behind the God of creation who made you to be in His image. And when that failed through, through man's sin, He gave His Son to restore that. In fact, that's the reason why God must have first place. Because God is eternal. Before all of these things, God was there. And after all of them are gone, God will remain. God being eternal means the things that he offers are eternal as well. You may, have, uh, an, you may worship and idolize money which offers you comfort and, and a, a level of joy And yet, it's momentary compared to the joy and the blessing that God offers in an eternal home with a spiritual and eternal life with Him. He offers things that idols are incapable of doing. That also means the love that an idol may offer you is not the love that God offers. God offers a selfless and sacrificial love. Idols take, but they often fail to give. God loved you so much that he gave everything, giving his son Jesus to die for you on the cross. This morning, as you've sat sat here and you've thought about these things, maybe you realize that I need the prayers of the saints. I need those around me to help lift me up because there are idols in my life Maybe I didn't think about before, but there are certainly idols in my life today, and I seek to overcome them. And I want to return God to his rightful place in my heart. Or maybe you're here today and you realize God has never had his rightful place in my heart. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus said this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, And we will come to him and make our abode, our dwelling, our home with him. Going forward from that, the apostles describe us as temples of God. Where his likeness resides within us. Jesus says, that is what I will do. Love Jesus by following him today. If you are here this morning and you would like to learn more about what that means, about what, who, what Jesus has done, who he is, and how he can be the, the power by which we can overcome idolatry in this world and have the glory of God restored in our lives, we would love to sit down and discuss that with you and talk more about what his gospel reveals. If you are here today and you, have, you know these things and you know what Jesus is calling you to do, And you are ready to say, I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to begin shining forth his image in this world. We are here ready to assist you with that. But I encourage you, whatever your need may be, let us not wait. If we can assist you this morning in returning or coming to God for the first time, let's talk about that together right now. Come forward as we stand and sing.